Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Admin. You know, um, well, today is part two of the ongoing discussion concerning walking, leaping, and praising God. And we said this can be the result of the proper application of love, just like uh, Peter and John, you know, said to the man at the gate, God, beautiful, that such as we have, yeah, such as I have, give I thee, rise up and walk in the name of the Lord Jesus. And just that singular administration of the power that's in the name of Jesus, the Bible says he was affected in all three realms. He was walking physically he was because he was physically affected. He was leaping because emotionally he had been affected. And he was praising God because something had happened in his spirit. It's in the same way that love, when it is well applied, it can affect us on all sides. Today, flip the coin a bit. And let me be frank with you. If love is not properly administrated, it can ruin your life uh, on all three sides. Physically, for some people, uh, some have gone into all sorts of uh, fatigue, uh, all sorts of sicknesses, all sorts of dementia, all sorts of mental health challenges, you know, simply because of the frustrations that they got from their marriage, you know, and uh, for some, it has affected their Christian walk, you know, some have lost faith in God because their marriages pushed them too far. Some have backslidden outrightly because their marriages pushed them too far, you know, all, all sorts uh, have happened, you know, I saw a movie, uh, a couple of days ago, you know, just resting myself uh, after the day, you know, and a beautiful movie, very slow pace, you know, with some of these iconic old actors and actresses, you know, like a reunion of um, an old music band from the 60s, now gathering together again in the late 90s or in the early 20s, uh, 2020s, you know, and um, uh, 20 years ago, when the band was running, um, uh, the Mr. Frank uh, knew that his wife was also very, very close to his best friend in the band, you know, Mr. Leo, you know, uh, but I guess he didn't know how far that closeness went, you know, long story made short, 20 years after, you know, their son is about uh, 20 something years. And then uh, their daughter, uh, Mr. Frank's son is about, I think about 22 years. And the daughter is about 20 years um, uh, from medical school. And um, one controversy led to the other and they decided to do a DNA test only for Mr. Frank to find out that his two children, they were actually uh, fathered by Leo, his best friend, you know. But I love the equanimity with which they took it. You know, they decided that they were not going to rock the boat. They were not going to destroy one another's lives or the lives of the children because of this discovery. You know, uh, but in my mind, I was like, wow. Hmm. Now, wow. Hmm. And we hear that things like this are coming up every day, even around us. People going to do DNA testing on their children and discovering that one out of a few uh, came from somebody else other than the parents at home. So all sorts happen. And today, I just want you and I, we are going to pray. I, I'm hoping that before the Q&A, we should be able to pray again for maybe another five to 10 minutes. Because what I want us to share on today it's very, 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 very critical. It's very, very, very important. You know, I, I, I think that gradually we Christians, we are losing the essence of the Christian, uh, the Christian life. You know, we have become a bit far too transactional uh, than being spiritual, and we have become far too social than to be deep spiritually, you know? So uh, we read the Bible, but we just read it. It doesn't matter if we see 
in real life what the Bible promises in the in the in the pages. You know, so even if the Bible says you shall lay your hands on the sick and the sick shall recover, even if you don't see uh, your children recovery when you pray for them or you pray for somebody in church and they don't recover, it doesn't matter. We just continue. And the, and the, and the gulf between what is written in the scriptures and what we are seeing in the practical day-to-day -day life is beginning to grow wider and wider and wider and wider and wider. And yet, uh, First John, this is not part of my teaching, but I just want to refer to this. First John, and in chapter one, you know, in verse number three, he said, that which we have seen, like we've seen it in scripture, and we have heard, it has been taught to us, we declare unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And guess what? The fruit of that fellowship was declared in verse 2. He said, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and we bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was with the Son, we have also seen it, we have heard it, we have handled it. And now we are inviting you to come and participate in the same. In verse 5 it says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and we declare unto you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. But people are suffering and gradually permitting their suffering to go on. People are suffering and they are gradually becoming, um, uh, what's that word now? They have surrendered to the situation. They have surrendered to the situation. People are no longer laboring to take the promise of God's word. I say, oh, God, you said this. It is still here in black and white. And then do the necessary warfare and labor of the spirit to make sure that what is written here comes to pass in their real life. People are no longer doing that. You know, divorce is cheaper now than to labor in the place of prayer. You know, I mean, why should you continue to pray? Even the person you are praying for doesn't even have respect for your prayer. So why should you continue to pray for them? Let me tell you, our parents of old, when they prayed, they didn't pray because the person they are praying for was respecting their prayer. When they prayed, they didn't pray because, um, what's that word? That uh, they were seeing signs and encouragement. No sign, no encouragement. The person they are praying for, the more they pray, the more the, more the person got worse. But they were devoted to pray. So that finally, when they answered to their prayers came, they had waited for too long. Now that the answer has even come back, they just, oh, praise God, I'm glad that you have changed and you have seen the light now. You know, they, they, they were not even so much into sharing testimonies, but they were hard in labor to bring the word of God to pass. You know, so today's message, I think, in my own estimation, I, I'm just, uh, just my opinion, I think it's going to be one of the best messages that could help turn around circumstances in our lives. Let's go back to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. That's where we have been discussing from. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3 and verse 8 is our text for, for the month. It says, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple and entered with them into the temple and um, into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, uh, let's go back to verse 1 like we did last week to now start the story from there. But today, I'll just take verse 1, only one verse. You know, verse 1 says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. At the hour of prayer at the hour of prayer. Now, this was something known to everybody so that the early church knew when the hour of prayer was. Every husband, every wife knew the hour of prayer. Every boy, every girl knew the hour of prayer. Ask yourself today, 
in the church of Jesus Christ today, do we still have the hour of prayer that's universal? No, we don't. Different churches have prayer meetings, different days and at different times. But is there a religion you know that is still keeping to their schedules of hour of prayer? Yes. There's still a religion that keeps to the scheduled hour of prayer. And at that particular time, they will let out the blast of the horns to call people to prayer that it is time. Now, here's what I found out. In Christianity, it's a bit difficult to maintain a good routine of prayer life. And this is, uh, and this is because of one particular factor, the time factor. If you call a Christian to say, come, let us pray, you know, um, the first psychological attack that they are going to get is, how long is this going to be for? <laughs> you know, and so they will now ask you, oh, all right, let's pray. Uh, what time? And for how long, please? Then they are in apprehension, wondering how long is it going to say? If you say two hours, oh, I would have loved to share. Then if you say one hour, oh, I go manage. Then if you say it's just for 30 minutes, okay, sure, I think I can manage that. Depend. People can't even manage 30 minutes of prayer nowadays. You call for 10 minutes of prayer. In, in two minutes, their voices start drowning. And I, I, something on my inside gets tickled because I don't think people understand the spirituality of prayer until you call them to pray. Suddenly you are yawning. Suddenly somewhere is itching. Suddenly your energy is drained. Meanwhile, Turn off that prayer program and turn on a movie, your whole being will come alive. That's to tell you, the movie appeals to your flesh, the prayer appeals to your spirit, but you, you are living in the flesh more than in the spirit. You are a person of the flesh much more than you are a person of the spirit. So when flesh things are put on, you gyrate. Then when spirit things are put on, you cower in. But God will have to give us grace to change that narrative in the name of Jesus. So the first challenge that we Christians will meet with is the time. But guess what? The early church had the prayer hour. And here's what I learned from Jesus in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 6. If you can, you can turn to it, but I'll just put it to you straight up. In Matthew 6, Jesus was speaking from verse number 9 to verse number 15. He said in verse 9, after this manner, therefore pray. This is the manner of prayer. He didn't say this is the prayer, the Lord's prayer that we must rehearse, even though that's how we use it. We use it as the Lord's prayer. So when they say, let us pray the Lord's prayer, we start, our oh, Father, are in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, blah, 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 until the, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. But he wasn't giving us a recital. Rather, he said, this is the syllable of a complete prayer. This is the syllable of a complete prayer. This prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer gives us the six points, the six bullets that make up for a complete prayer. That if we understand it and teach it to our generation, it will help to minimize uh, the, 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 the challenge as to how much time we are going to spend in prayer, and it will help us to develop a chain of prayer life that can, that can erupt anywhere. You can be with someone, and you guys are just finished eating a lunch, and say, can we just uh, spend uh, a moment in prayer? And they understand what you are saying, that you are saying we should go through the six points of Jesus' syllabus of a complete prayer. And ba -ba 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 -ba, you know, uh, expeditious, you can go through the six points. You know, as a matter of fact, whoever is leading the prayer understands that the rest of us, we also understand even the, the, the protocol, the procedure. So we know where you should start. We, we know what should follow. We know what should come next. And if you spend too much time on one, somebody can tell you and say, okay, brother, that's enough. Let's move on to the next step because we need to finish this thing. This is the discipline that we are, that we are trying to bring back, you know. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it sometimes. <clears throat> you know, uh, you are in a you are in a, uh, a, a vehicle traveling. You know, and perhaps somebody in another religion uh, says that it's their prayer hour. Can the driver please stop the car? 
Nobody quarrels with it. You know why? Two things. Number one, we respect their devotion to prayer. But number two, we know it's not going to be for so long. They'll step out in five minutes. Everybody knows the routine. I, I mean, every one of them uh, of that faith, they know the routine. Whoever is leading knows that the others understand the sequence. So they step out in five, seven minutes, the whole routine is finished, and they come back into the car. You see, what they are doing is intermittently renewing their touch with their God intermittently in short forms in short periods of encounters they are re reminding their soul of their devotion they are re re reminding themselves of their dedication you know but christians can't do that number one if you told them to stop the car you want to do a christian prayer uh, we have not respected our own prayer life or prayer hour enough for the rest of the world to respect it. Number two, everybody will be wondering how long is this going to be for? What if this person starts talking in other tongues? You know, <laughs> this affects all of us. My, my wife is here. I hope she don't mind me telling this. You know, when we newly got married, you know, I, I used to speak in tongues, you know, very loud. Maybe I still do. And she used to say, ah, no, praying along with you, uh, you, you, you stay too long in prayer. I, I'm a worshiper. I, I, I don't have any quarrel with God. God and I, we are in love. I, I'm, I'm a worshiper. And she's a great, great worshiper. And she's like, you, but when you start praying, you just keep praying. You know? Can't you pray a concise, short prayer? Let us go and start our day. Must every day be like preparation for a crusade? And you know, it is this thing that I'm talking about that was missing. I didn't have the understanding to create a concise, uh, syllables of daily routine prayer like what Jesus recommended. And this is one of the reasons why <clears throat> a lot of people can't enjoy a good prayer discipline today because uh, there is no syllables. There is no syllables. Uh, I know for some of us who have been Catholics, you know, when we're in the Catholic church, yeah, some of it was a bit predictable because they tell you, say, uh, uh, the ten Hail Marys um, to our fathers and uh, one creed is instantly you can capture it. I think I'll finish this in twenty minutes. You know, and you go to a corner and uh, you, you you start your prayer. So there got to be routine. That's what I'm really trying to uh, draw out here. There's got to be routine concerning prayer and prayerfulness to protect your love life. Yes. There's got to be routine in the place of prayer, raising an altar to protect your love life. You can't just leave things to, to chance. No, 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 no. You can't just leave things to chance. You have to protect what you have with the instrumentality of prayer and let it be routine prayer. I, 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 I say let it be routine prayer so that your prayer is not just about your request from God. Your prayer will also be refining your relationship with God. You know, the more you pray, the better you become at praying. You cannot learn to pray except by praying. You just have to pray to learn to pray. You can only pray better if you keep praying. That's the only way to learn it. That's the only way to learn it. And there's nothing as spiritual as prayer. I'm telling you, studying the Bible is good. It's spiritual. You know, uh, singing praises and worship is good. And dancing is good. It's also very spiritual. But let me tell you, the true hallmark of your spirituality is prayer. It's prayer. And the enemy will try to play tricks on our minds and say, no, you are either a, a Bible studying person or a prayer person. And then you make it look as though you should choose between one of them. You don't have to choose. You can have everything. You can be a prayer warrior, be a studious person, be a praise person, be a singer, be somebody who confesses the word, but make sure you have an altar, a place of prayer to protect what you have. Now, let me give you five quick signs, five quick signs to show you that what you have is already showing uh, red light. You know, when you're driving an automobile, you know, sometimes you could fill up the gas tank uh, at the beginning of your journey, 
and you're just enjoying yourself and you're driving, but somewhere along the line, there's this little red light that will flash at you and it says to you, gas. <laughs> In other words, we are not stopping you right now, but we just want you to know that your gas is low. So either you go re refill now, otherwise, soon after this, we will just stop you. And uh, these are signs to let you know that the gas is low in the relationship. Number one sign, number one sign, the loss or deplete of trust. The loss or the deplete of trust. When trust starts waning, even before it starts creating quarrel, when trust starts depleting, even before it becomes a, a subject of altercation, it is already a sign that you are running low on gas. It's time to pray for that relationship. When you start, you the person who is experiencing the deplete in the trust, you should be the one who should start the prayer. Don't think to yourself that, ah, no, uh, I think God is leading me. Because for a lot of people, their spirit of suspicion has been renamed the spirit of discernment. I think the Lord is leading me. I just can't confirm it yet, but something in me tells me that something is going on. You know, then they now go fishing, looking for uh, passwords and all sorts and all, all of that. The moment you find yourself wandering in suspicion, you, are, you should be the first to kneel down. You should be the first person to pick up the Bible and start praying to protect that your relationship, what you have. Because sometimes your quest to find evidences to buttress your suspicion is a razor, sharp razor blade that cuts asunder the ligaments and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the fabric of your relationship. I'm telling you. Just that moment when you're carrying that suspicion around and you are looking for, you're already cutting, in the realm of the spirit, you're already cutting the fabric and the ligaments that hold the relationship together. <laughs> I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. The deplete of trust. You know, the deplete of trust. Number two, the loss or the deplete of intimacy is proof that there's need to pray now. You are running low on gas. You are running low on gas. I know they say that familiarity breeds contempt, but please hear me. No matter how much familiarity has eroded your relationship, if your intimacy begins to dry up, raise an alarm in the place of prayer. <clears throat> I know for the singles, you are not supposed to have sex. You know, uh, you shouldn't have sex you know, before you get married, you know, that's scriptural standard. But please check your heart to know, check your heart to know uh, and sense it when you are no longer attracted to the person, even though the two of you are in a planning uh, mode, preparing for the wedding day, you are marching towards the wedding day. Thank you, Binta Musa. You know, you are marching towards the wedding day, but your attraction to one another is already depleting. Binta Musa, hallelujah. You're, you're, you are marching towards the wedding day, but your attraction is depleting. It's time to pray. Something is already going wrong. It's a signal that, no, 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 the, the foundational blocks are not sitting properly. <laughs> Do you know that there are people who have been married and um, when they open up to you, they'll tell you that the wedding day was the day they actually realized they made a mistake. The wedding day, that was when they realized that they made a mistake. And guess what? They have been carrying the senses, the, 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 the feeling of that thing of something is not going right. Why is my uh, 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 attraction or appreciation of this person's presence? Why is it depleting? Instead of them to pray, they went ahead, nevertheless, to go get married. And if the foundation be broken, what can the righteous do? And today they are in hardships. They are facing perilous times. Because friends, hear me. Sex or sexual um, 
uh, sin is not the only sin that can bring uh, 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 afflictions into your relationship. Second Timothy, and in chapter 3, from verse 1 to verse number 5, for some of you joined us for prayer, you heard when I was rebuking those spirits. These are spirits. They are not just named circumstances. They are spirits assigned by Satan in this last days to open up your airspace, to open up your love life for affliction. It says number one, it says in verse one, know this, that in the last days that perilous times shall come. Why? How? Verse two, for men shall be lovers of their own, of their own self. The love of their own self opens the gates to the enemy. Others shall become covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. They begin to lean towards unnatural affections, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than the lo lovers of God, having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. All of these things, they are entrapments by Satan to open up your life for future suffering. Future suffering. So when you begin to see these things showing in, in little, little forms, it is a call to start your prayer routine. Number three, when you begin to feel like you are being used in this relationship, you know, uh, like my wife and I, we've defined and uh, explicated in several uh, uh, sessions of this platform that marriage is a union of two servants competing to serve one another. Marriage is a union of two forgivers, you know. But you see, when you begin to get that feeling that you are being used in this, in this relationship, something has fallen through the cracks in the realm of the spirit and only prayer can recover it. When you begin to have this feeling that, ah, no, I love to serve, but now I think I am being used. That feeling that you have received is not a revelation from God. It's an indication that something is breaking, even on your own side. What they are doing to you may be correctly categorized as using you. But now that you are feeling that you are being used, something is cracking, and it is time to pray. Number four, when you begin to feel that in this relationship, there is more argument than a cordial conversation. It's time to pray. It's time to pray. The Bible says, is any afflicted? Let him pray. It didn't say let him call for uh, a pastor, a deacon, or a prophet to pray for him or her. Let him pray. You pray. We'll join you to pray, but you must pray. When your home becomes a debate society or a parliamentary uh, session where they are throwing knives and tables at each other. It's time to pray. It's not time to take the matters to your gossip gang. And for some of you, please hear me. Please hear me. Stop talking to people that massage your ego if you want to repair your marriage. Yeah, write that down. Stop talking to people that will massage your ego if you ever had it in mind to repair your marriage. The one person I loved to talk to when I was in Nigeria, you know, when we're growing up in our marriage, you know, about 20, uh, some, some decades ago, was Apostle Israel Abba. I, I, I keep saying to people, that was the only man that told me, Kennedy, you must be stupid. And the thing sounded like music in my ear. <laughs> he said, you must be stupid. And I, it, it sounded nice, you know. You should have somebody in your life that is a, an authority over your life that whatever they say to you, you don't second guess it. Yeah, he and I, we got to talk, I think it was in 2019. I can't remember what even led to that conversation. I said, sir, I still hold it on my own record and I hope your records are straight with mine. You never told me one thing to do and I second guess it, no. Somebody offended me, you told me, go and call them. I didn't tell you, you didn't understand what they did to me, no. I went and I obeyed and I went to call them. Who is the authority over your life? How is it that your wife can't tell anybody? There's nobody in your life that your wife can report you to, report in the sense of call for help. And when they step into the matter, your madness will vanish. How come? 
How is it that you are greater than the almighty God? Sincerely, you are. You are greater than the almighty God. You know how I know? God Almighty was upset with Israel in the wilderness because uh, when, when Moses went up to the mountain to receive the commandment, Aaron and the rest of them, they melted gold and created a golden calf. And they said, this is the God that brought us out from Egypt. And God was mad with them and said to Moses, I'm going to wipe all of them out and I'll start a new family with you. And Moses said to God, ha, ah, don't do this. If you do it, the Egyptians would say you had power to bring them out. You didn't have the power to take them in. And the Bible records the almighty God repented. A man gave counsel to the almighty God. A man rebuked the almighty God. And the almighty God repented. And yet, here you are thinking it's psychedelism, it's exposure, maybe the... The, 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 your education and maybe your economic class and earning, you know, so who can talk to you? Nobody. Once you have taken a position, the position is sacrosanct, it can't be changed. You might just be greater than the almighty God. Learn to have authority over you. So if that relationship begins to record more of quarrels, emotional pain, inconsiderateness, it is time to pray. It is time to pray. I'm just trying to show you people how that good sex and great sex is not the only secret to sustaining a great marriage. As a matter of, as a matter of fact, sex can die because of, because of bottled up ill feelings. But when prayer comes, prayer will wash away the ill feelings, heal the heart, rejuvenate even the, the sexual intimacy. Prayer can do that. Prayer can do that. Because in the place of prayer, you can talk to God in a manner that you can't talk to another person else. In the place of prayer, <laughs> the kind of solution you never thought you could afford, the Heavenly Father can release it free of charge. But a lot of Christians today, they have become too social, too transactional, and they don't really know spiritual depths. Lastly, the fifth sign that you need to start praying when you begin to gradually slip into depression or your marriage becomes an isolation, you know, like two railway lines going to the same place, but they never touch. When your marriage becomes that railway kind of relationship, it's time to pray. Because hear me, hear me, and I say this very clearly, unequivocal. You can have a home of peace, no quarrel, no fighting, no argument. And yet in that home, you are just parallel lines. And you too, you know it. You never fight, you never quarrel, but you are not doing life together. Do your thing, I do my thing. That's not marriage. You may think that you guys are running a safe system. Your children are being damaged. Write it down. Your children are being crushed. And the day you get to interview them, when they become adults, they'll tell you, ah, me, I will never marry. And you wonder, why won't you think of marriage? Ah, no, what you and dad, what, what you and dad had, or what you and mom had, is that marriage? Is that what I should look forward to getting myself into? No, no, no way. No way. You guys, you only laughed when visitors came to the house. It's important that you and I will know these signs and go for prayer. Now, the concise prayer, the concise prayer, so that you can do it regularly. Jesus gave us six points. He said, it should start with our Father who art in heaven. In other words, appreciate the adoption by God the Father. Number two, hallow be thy name. Offer a praise song or worship to hallow his name. Number three, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Declare your unconditional surrender, even to his will, surrendering your earth to him. Number four, he says, give us this day. Make your personal request. Request for your needs and for your wants. I need to, uh, I need to emphasize that. You are not just supposed to pray for your needs. Pray for your wants. He will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. But if you want to drive a Rolls Royce, ask him for it. And if you can believe him for it, he can supply it as well. Number five, he says, uh, 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray for protection from temptation. And lastly, the sixth point, he said, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Close your, your prayers with thanksgiving for his power, for his kingdom, and for his glory. This six point give us a concise syllabus for a complete prayer. And the more you begin to train yourself, uh, you know, to go through this routine, the more you begin to find yourself able to cultivate a viable prayer life, you know, that, can, that you can use to support uh, your, your, your love life. Verse, verse 13 of Matthew 6, so, or, or can I just pause here? Does anybody have a question that so far that from what I have shared? Any question? From what has been said so far. Any question from what has been said so far, please? Or any observation, point of clarification you, you need me to make? Anybody? You can just raise your hand so that we'll ask you to unmute. So marriage is an alliance of two nations. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Okay, who, uh, anyone, or should I continue? Should I just continue? Okay, all right, I, I'll, I'll continue. <clears throat> um, so I said, um, just a second, let me watch this, yeah. Now, in Matthew 6, in verse number 13, Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Deliver, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Please, that, that verse is very pregnant. You need to know how to spend time in prayer to protect your father, protect your mom, protect your husband, protect your wife, protect your sons, protect your daughters, protect your fiance, protect your friend from temptations. Please hear me. In Genesis chapter three and in verse number 13, in Genesis chapter three and in verse number 13 again, the Bible speaking says, and God asked Eve, what is this that you have done? And she said, the, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Another translation says, the serpent seduced me and I did eat. Another translation says, the Satan tricked me and I did eat. Now, please hear me. Please hear me. Adam and Eve are living in a perfect state of the glory of God without any environmental influences. They were not living in a city where you would say, okay, uh, uh, sexual exposure is, every, is everything. The advertorials are done on billboards with uh, sexually explicit uh, materials. The uh, movies are now sexually explicit. This is sexually explicit. No, 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 no. There was no environmental influence whatsoever. And yet, in that perfect state, in the glory of God, Satan succeeded to twist their minds and they sinned. Please hear me. The Satan you are dealing with, he is not an idiot. He is not an amateur. If he had the wherewithal to trick a people that were living in the perfect state of God's glory. How much more he has huge advantages against us today, except we deploy the instruments of prayer, which, which brings us into partnership with the almighty God. So we should pray earnestly to be delivered from temptations. Like I said, if you go through that Second Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse number 5, you know that the temptations are not about smoking or about drinking, sniffing up drugs or any of those things. There are things Satan is still able to use to, to open up your life to perilous times, except you close up those doors using the instruments of prayer. In Second Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse number 3, Second Corinthians 11, and in verse 3, Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, and he said, I fear for you, lest 
Satan beguile you just like he did with Eve in the garden. I'm afraid, so I'm praying for you guys. I don't want Satan to mess up your mind like he twisted that of Eve in the garden of Eden. Please hear me, please hear me. Satan or the serpent twisted the mind of Eve. He did not twist the mind of Adam. It was a relationship that twisted his own mind. His relationship with Eve, that's what twisted his mind. Satan did not do that. Satan's trick was on Eve, not on Adam. But what twisted Adam's mind was his marriage, his relationship with Eve. Be careful. Prayer is, is our, is our, uh, you know, like, it's like our space suit. You know, when you go to space, you got to put on that suit to survive. Otherwise, the atmosphere there may be so adversarial that it would destroy you. Prayer is what creates a, a spirit space jacket over us to survive all the wilds and all the vicissitudes and all the atrocities and all the agents and agencies of Satan. I know right now in the, uh, uh, in the 21st century church, we try to act as though witchcraft is obsolete. Discussing witchcraft is like anachronistic, you know, uh, topic. No, 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 no. If you don't believe in witchcraft, then they can't touch you. You're right. Don't believe in gravity and jump off a 29-story building and see if, if nothing will happen. Witchcraft is real. They are still operating today. They are shutting down ministries, shutting down establishments, shutting down lives, imprisoning destinies. Because people are not praying enough. People are not praying accurately. And some are not praying at all. Hear me. Please, let me give you this, this uh, joinder. So you don't go and misquote me anywhere. Just like not everybody has problem with sugar. Their insulin production is perfect. They can eat 10 kilos of sugar with every cup of coffee that they drink. They will never have problem with diabetes. But if in your own family, your insulin production has a problem, one cube of sugar a week is enough to destroy your system. Don't imitate those who have a better metabolism than yours or a different metabolism from yours. I'm saying that to bring out this point that what I'm saying right now, there are some people that you see them, no matter how they live their life, things just seem to go well for them. So how is Pastor Ken coming here to talk about you know, witchcraft and the devil and all? Let me tell you, if your spiritual line or metabolism is not the same thing as theirs, if you imitate them, you'll be sorry for the imitation. Just like somebody imitating sugar uh, people, who don't have any problems with, with insulin. Please, fight your battle and fight to win. This thing is called the, 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 the good fight of faith. Let us stop embarrassing the kingdom of God. Let us fight as true soldiers. The Bible didn't just call us children. We are children of God. We are sons of God. Yes, he has called us disciples, but he also calls us soldiers. We should fight to win. We should fight to win. You know, we should fight to win. I don't know where you are in your own life right now. I don't know where you are in your own circumstance and in your own situation. Remember this. God, on the one hand, he made him to be seen for us who knew no sin, so that through that exchange sacrifice, we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In the same vein, as God made him to be seen, the Bible says that God also made him a curse for us. Galatians chapter 3 and in verse number 13, he said that God has delivered us from the curse of the law. How? By making Jesus a curse. He made him to become a curse as it is written. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Please hear me. If just making Jesus sin on your behalf and on my behalf so that we can become new creations was sufficient to cover the whole redemptive package, why would God still make him a curse for us? Because he knew there was the need to also deal with the issue of curses. 
curses. Now, the, the scripture calls it the curse of the law. Now, let me tell you what it actually means in a more um, explicating uh, um, um, colloquialism. Curses are by law. Even when the voodoo man wants to curse you, you have to tie it to a law. Is that the law of your blood? The law of running stream, as long as this stream keeps running, that is how this thing we have dropped here as a cause, it will continue in perpetuity. They must tie it to a law. So God says, he has made Jesus a curse for us to deliver us from the curse of the law. Number three, the Bible says that though he was rich, he became poor so that through his poverty, we might be made rich. And number four, and number four, the Bible now speaking again says that uh, uh, by his stripes, we have been healed. Isaiah chapter 53, uh, first Peter chapter two, and then also I think uh, uh, in Matthew, it speaks about us being healed by the stripes of Jesus. So let me ask you, do Christians still fall sick and sometimes die from the sickness? Yes. Is there any imperfection with the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has paid? No. What is the discrepancy? What was the explanation for the discrepancy between what Jesus you know, paid for with his stripes and then Christians falling sick? It's called enforcement. It's called enforcement. What God has done is perfect. You and I must individually enforce it. Though he was rich, he became poor so that through his poverty might become rich. We have to enforce it. The Bible says, cause the seed that hang it upon the tree, so it hung upon the tree, so as to deliver us from the curse. We have to enforce it. Every curse that you know, don't ignore it. Please hear me. Warfare, according to scriptural protocol, warfare is always initiated from the earth and confirmed from the heavens. Whatsoever you bind here on earth is bound in heaven. If out of 10, you bind nine, heaven will not put the extra to say, okay, we'll bind you. Maybe you forgot, maybe inadvertently, you just overlooked this, this tenth one. So we'll bind all 10 for you. No, whatsoever you bind here on earth shall be bound in heaven. You bind nine out of 10. It, nine out of 10 shall be bound in heaven. The tenth will be let loose here. Whatsoever you lose here on earth, it shall be loose in heaven. The warehouse of God is overflowing with riches and resources waiting to be depleted. If you can just lose them and claim God's goodness. It's that implementation that is the difference between lives. You know, there are some people that in their youth, they pray so many hours for so long a time. Now in their adult or older, old age, they can't pray more than 20 minutes in a week. But you see their lives flourishing. If you imitate them as a young person, your life will crash because you do not have the foundation and the investment that they have already made. There are others who have prayed many times, many years prior. But their sinfulness and carnality, compromised living, depleted their account. They must start afresh. They must start afresh. So sometimes when you wonder, why is our family not changing? What's, what's going on? Please, these are some of the things. So you need to really, really pray. You need to really pray. You, you, you saw Paul. You know, Paul was warning, uh, warning the church. He said, be, be careful about this sin that does so easily beset you. We read these things and just gloss over. What does it mean? He said, there is a sin that Satan has found. This one is cheaper on you. It easily tricks you. It is a sin that you yourself, you also enjoy. So you usually will say, stop it, I like it. So it's, it, it's difficult to walk away from it. And Satan has capitalized on it. And Paul said, be careful of the sin that does so easily beset you. It besets your foundation. It routes. It, it jeopardizes what you are, what you are mounting, what you are building. We are going to pray for just about ten minutes. Then we'll take questions because we still have about twenty-four minutes in the ninety minutes program. We are going to pray, and you got to open up your heart. 
If you can, unmute your mic. Let your voice be heard in Zion so that the voices of others will be in agreement with yours and syndicate the faith. Let it become as the voice of the church of the firstborn. Diverse and unified even by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Unmute your mics if you can. You know, we are going to pray that God deliver my life from these evil temptations. Deliver my relationship from evil temptations. Use after in between those, then you target other things that are personal to your life and to your family. You know, so it's not just sex, it's not just smoking, it's not just beer drinking or alcohol or sniffing or drugs. There are things the enemy wants to use to bring peril and hardships even into your life. And the first Timothy chapter three, verse one to five captures all nineteen of them that Satan wants to use. Hallelujah! Say with me, Heavenly Father, in the Heavenly Father. Assessor representing my family, representing my love life in the name of the Lord Jesus. I ask deliver us from temptation, deliver us from temptation, deliver us from the spirits that are in the air, resisting our progress, and the people that are in the in the name of the Lord Jesus. To pray that prayer, the spirit that you use, that you will convert us to bring us into prayer. Even the spirit that you use, that you will pull our minds, use our minds, to bring us 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 to it was the of the work of God in my life. My God and my Father is a lawyer. Can but say, Are you praying right now? In my love, you pray right now. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, every posting, every pride, every blasphemies, every unholiness, every unforgiveness, every slandering, every without self-control, that the enemy has used the man, 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 Jesus, 
Jeremiah chapter 33 says, and in verse 3, he said, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou didn't not know of. Call upon me, and I will. And this is God that is giving you a promise, it's not man. And God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should repent. He is not, uh, he's not in Congress. He is not presumptuous. He is not, uh, he doesn't speak without meaning what he has said. He doesn't just talk for talking's sake. He means it. He said, call upon me. Open your mouth right now, begin to call upon him. Whatever that situation is, even in your private life, whatever that situation is in your love life, call upon him right now. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, call upon him. Hallelujah. Father, you said, call upon me. We are now calling upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I call upon you right now. In my left I call upon you right now. I call upon you in your situation, oh God, that appears to be your burden, oh God. Father, every of an earthly concern, oh God, that I have expressed to you in recent times, Father, I call upon you. And I ask, oh God, that you show me great and mighty things I do not know, Father. Father, you are the one who gives wisdom and with it understanding, oh God, that will lead me to your plan and purpose for me, oh God. Father, your promise, oh God, to me is that you will show me, oh God. Father, I'm willing, oh God, I want to see, I want to hear from you in the name of Jesus. Father, speak to me concerning that dream, speak to me concerning the situation in my home. Speak to me, my other Father. Brighter and brighter, whose path gets brighter and brighter in the name of Jesus becomes brighter and brighter. It's an impediment, whatever is against you, of you know, better light or to. Lord Jesus, supernatural intervention. Thank you, O God, for supernatural reconciliation. Thank you for supernatural restorations of that which has been broken. Father, step into our situation and save our Lord. Save your people, O God. Save, O God, O Son of Father God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And amen. And amen. Okay, now go back and begin to build a more formidable prayer circle. You know, I love something that my uh, sister uh, Lola, you know, Stevens, you know, she does. She networks with other, you know, other groups and other friends just to make sure that she has a prayer chain going. Please hear me. It's good to have friends. You go to play badminton together. You play uh, uh, lawn tennis together. Develop network of friends that you pray together. If you can, some of them stronger than you in the commitment to prayer. Draw close to them because of that prayer. I'm telling you, prayer is what we are going to need to recover our cities, to recover our nations, to recover our families back to God psychedelism will not do it. Please, I'm telling you, I love psychedelism. You know, I, I love to dress well. I love to dr drive something that's nice. I, I love the good things of life. But please, have a secret doggedness. A secret doggedness, you know, in the place of prayer. You know, let, let, let it not even show on you. People will know that, no, when you shut your door and you knew that, that you can be there for two hours, just groaning in the spirit. That you don't even speak English. All you just do is cry before God. Just cry before God. Have a, have a deliberate altar in your secret. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, let's, let's have a short discussion before we round up. We have 14 more minutes. You know, uh, I, I made a statement at the beginning of this uh, discussion. I said, you should participate in your love life. Uh, and I took us in the realm of the spirit concerning prayer. Now, in the realm of the social, I want to share, with, I want to ask you, learn to participate in your love life. And by this, I mean,
take it upon yourself to school your partner on how to love you better. Take it upon yourself to tell your partner how to love you better. Don't, don't expect them to be mind readers. You know, I ah, know all these years, if you really wanted to know by now, you should have known. And you can see now, he didn't know, or she didn't know, or she doesn't know, he doesn't know. So don't leave it uh, like that. Take it upon yourself to tell that person, this is what I will need from you so that you can love me better. So my question to you now is, what does your partner need to know to love you better? What does your partner need to know about your ongoing love life in order to love you better? Who wants to start? You know, like my wife would say, either you volunteer or start calling your names. You know, who wants to start? All right, my dear sister Joy, I like the smile in your picture. So that has drawn me to you. So if you might be the first person I'm going to call on. What does my brother need to know, you know, to love you better? He's doing great already, but to take it to the next level for you, what does he need to know? So if you don't mind, please, uh, Sister Joy, the uh, Megara, if you could unmute yourself. And if you can, uh, you can turn on your camera if you're in a good place to tell us. What does he need to know to love you better? Okay, good evening, Pastor Ken. Good evening, Pastor Tinu, and everyone on the call. Uh, so I always look forward to Monday evenings, you know, and it's become a part of me and um, it leaves me really refreshed. And honestly, I, my life is better for it. You know, I, what my husband needs to love, needs to know to love me better yes, is to look beyond my calm demeanor. Which is which I believe is a, is a gift from God. So if you know a lot of times he says you you don't someone doesn't even know when you are excited, mm. you know you just be, I know because I've lived with you for a long time, so I can tell when you're excited about something. I can mm. also tell when you're a bit worried. But if he will take you know spend more time mm. to inquire. Uh, rather than make assumptions, mm. you know, I think um, we'll be headed on, a, headed on a better path, you know, rather than make assumptions that uh, my, my wife is always calm, is always me, you know, there was a time he called me superwoman, I, I did not believe my reaction. I said, oh. don't call me superwoman, I'm not a superwoman. And, you know, I sat back, he, he was shocked. And he said, ah, what's with this reaction? You know, it even it spoke to me because I realized that Oh, I said, okay, so this is what this man thinks. And he just thinks, it just leaves me to do, you know, carry on with certain ways. And I'm putting up a face. I expect him to understand because I'm not the kind who will come and say, this is how I'm feeling or that's how I'm feeling. Because honestly, I thank God for his grace that sees me through the situations, the phases and seasons of my life. But then there's nothing wrong with my people say that when you ask a sick person, how are you? The person mm. is on his road to recovery. You know, mm -hmm. so sometimes I wish he'll take, he loves to do it. If oh. I tell him, he will listen. But sometimes you're also in, you know, engrossed in doing life that you don't even find the time to call anybody to say, okay, this is how I'm feeling or that's how he's doing me. You know, so I find myself explaining to him that sometimes when you see that I'm ext ex um, somewhat quiet, mm -hmm. find out for me. I may not come to you, not because I don't want to, but I'm oh. just also going through the motions and I don't remember that I even have to talk about it, you know. So because you will help me if you... For me than for you to think that I'm a superwoman and I always exactly. have... Exactly. So, so that's it, you know, I, I, you know, he too is going through life, things are happening around us, you know, there's a hustle and bustle, so we don't find time to sit down and talk the real, the deep talks. We get to do it once in a while, but I'd, I'd prefer that it's more, um, it's regular. And one way we have decided to do it is every week we go on a date. We do it, you know, but, you know, sometimes few and far in between, you know, so uh, we're, we're saying that we will be making it regular. 
once mm -hmm. or twice a week. If it's the movie, we go to do the movie. If it's to just sit down and talk and without the distractions, children and all of that, we mm -hmm. will do it. And then, you know, it's so instructive that I'm hearing this. I didn't even, for some reason, I didn't get the flow from last week because I think I joined late, you know. I'm at a place where I believe that I should be spending more time putting structure around my prayer life. And mo most of it would be to do it with him. But I'm an early riser. He runs his own business. So a lot of times I'm five, six, I'm up, I'm, I'm having a bath. I'm seated by my table, start, work starts for me. I'm still working from home, you know? So a lot of times I'm rushing through these things and I'm like, must I rush? I want to do this thing, but I, do, I seem to be struggling with time and all of it, you know? But I've said to myself, if it means anything to me, then I should give it priority. Wake up 30 minutes earlier, wake up one hour earlier, feed my soul, you know, because these are the things that keep me going. And these are the things that keep us going. So I should give it the priority that it deserves, you know. So these are the things. And hopefully as I hear these things, God will help me. I'll, right. you know, with grace, I'll be able to do the things that I hear. And then I'm, I can't be doing it alone. It takes two in this thing. I keep saying it. It takes two. We have to find a way, meeting points to do it together. He's willing, you know, yeah. but I see that, you know, it looks like I'm, I have to be the one where I come, let's do it like this. Let's do it like that, you know? So, so that's I, it for me. I totally Thank you. Feel you. I totally feel you, my dear sister Joy. And sister Bintu, I'll come to you next. I totally feel you, sister Joy. And sincerely, please take this from me. Number one. Uh, when you find out that you are the early riser, the other person is a late riser, and it seems like you guys can't um, meet to, to pray together, feed your own spirit, build up your own self. There is a place you are going to come to when you have been built up sufficiently that you are able to then sponsor a second prayer time in the day or in the night when both of you are now available. And that is the place to now catch them like spoon feeding a baby again. You now start, you know, spoon feeding them until they now germinate from there and say, you know what? This 10 minutes of kneeling down by the bedside is not sufficient. Can we like take out some time in the morning? And that's when you now realize that <laughs> what I wanted in the very beginning that I couldn't achieve with you, you are the one who is now suggesting it. And that's because one, you have taken time to build yourself. And once you are built up, you are able to speak spiritually instead of speaking from your flesh. And then two, you began to make sacrifice to have a second moment of prayer so as to be able to get him to come at his own convenience, even though it was sacrificed for you. And the payoff is something begins to grow on his own inside, and then he is now calling for the morning uh, prayer. Then lastly, concerning what you want, please hear me. I know you wish that when you are like this, you wouldn't say you are a superwoman. You should come ask you, baby, what's wrong? Please hear me. It is cheaper for you to send him the message than to wait for him to come and find the message. Try this one day. Just send a text, very short text. I'm not feeling good. <laughs> I'm telling you, short text. I'm not feeling okay. You two are sitting in the same living room and you just send him that text and he reads it. I'm telling you, get up. what's wrong? What's the meaning of this text? I've been meaning to talk to you. I'm going through this. I'm going to, oh my God, I didn't know. And that way you got in his attention. The reason I'm suggesting this is that if you don't find a way to release these things, they have a way of building up on the inside. And if left for too long on the inside, they become toxic after a while. Praise God. Yes, being to Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. What must your partner know to love you better? Okay. Um, okay, sir. Good evening, sir. This is my first time joining. Mm, good to have you. <laughs> yes. Through your wife, on the, um, I met her to the prayer mothers group and I decided to join today. Sister Joy, hi, it's me, Bintu. I know Sister Joy, we go way back. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Nice to hear from you. <laughs> yeah. this. Okay, sir. Sorry, it's like um, almost two years now. I got married in my 40s. Okay. Um, my husband is a minister. I'm a minister as well. Okay. Yes. And we both met in church. So we got married 2020. And um, I have a, I also married a widow that has four girls. 
So I have a husband and I have four girls added to me as well. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so um, one of the things that I, I, I did with my husband was uh, when we started staying together, I noticed that during the courtship, there was a, you know, he would want to hold, he would want to hug, he would want to, but you know, of course we were, I was celebrate. So I, you know, I was careful in that area. Yeah. So, so get married now. I actually had the expectation that, okay, this person who was all over me, <laughs> following me to the kitchen when he came to my house because I live alone. Uh -huh. So when he came to my house and, and we did this, you know, I'm like, okay, that's what I will get, you know, when it comes to romance. I just got to find out that my husband is not the cuddly, cuddly type. Mm. He's not the cuddle type like I am. He's good. He, he pampers me. I will not, I will be honest. Most things that I married an evil man, but I told God at first that I wanted to marry a white man. I said, okay, since the white man was not coming, I would marry a Nigerian man that, but a Nigerian man that behaved like an evil man. Oh, the one so that my husband is that kind. A Jewish bloodline. Uh -huh, the one word. that behaves like an evil man. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh -huh. But it's just that my husband is evil when it comes to money and food. Mm -hmm. Then this, then his evil side shows. But when it comes to making me comfortable and other things, yes, very, very good. But the cuddly thing was an issue. And I'm going to tell you what I did, sir. I did not keep quiet. Uh -huh. I didn't keep quiet. So it's like maybe I'm on my menstrual cycle or something. He will just leave me. We'll just talk and he won't hold. Or maybe um, it's time to sleep, but, you know, he won't hold to sleep. And I'm that kind of person. I can't, you can hold me to sleep all through, but at least at some point we part ways, you know. You know, I just want the pleasant surprises sometimes, you know, just hug me from behind or do something. And I had to tell him, I said, I don't like it. This is not the perception I had. Mm. This is it. You know, I understand you have a lot in your head. We're both ministers and all that. But this area, I got married in my 40s and all that. This one, we have to deal with it. I've it doesn't have to be just the sex. I want some things delivered in areas, you know. Yes. Yeah, so I said, I said, so the sex is good, but this area, we need to deal with it. Hmm. You need to hug. You need to know how to do this. You need to. And we've been working on it and it's been. I can tell you so far it's progress. But one thing I don't do is oh. because I am one that intercedes and also in ministry, I don't let things linger. Oh. I'd say that it is. We don't sleep over it. We deal oh. with it and then we move on. Oh. So, so far I can say it's much better, but I believe it could get much, 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 much better. And oh. then I just want to say thank you for the call of prayer. Um, we were at a meeting yesterday, and this was the same topic. Mm. <clears throat> and then I'm coming here now, and prayer seems to be the same topic. One of the things I did as a single was to go on retreats. I do that like the second day of the year. I go three days, get a room, and just stay. I do that like the month of my birthday, which is June, the first month I'm gone. And sometimes two, three times in the year again, I could do it in my house. Mm. So as I got married this year, I got up and I said, I'm going to do that. And I made sure that we had a retreat before the marriage so that I could see if we were spiritually compatible because that was key for me. Oh. Yeah, so this prayer call right now, it's a strong one for, I think almost all of us are in it. So I trust, you know, coming into the marriage, four kids trying to settle down and handle me, handle ministry. I do young people and singles, you know, from all that, you know, I felt like I've relaxed a bit, but I've been having that, since this year that okay it's time to get up it's time to get up so i was out yesterday just at a father in the lord's place samayidobo's place and this was the message i'm coming here now and this is the same thing so that's good. confirmation for me thank you yes the lord you say thank something you, in response to sister bintu hello honey can you hear me uh, at the, uh, you, you had uh, been to some, uh, you know, remarks. Would you like to say something in response? She was actually contributing. She wasn't asking a question. Okay. She was saying, she was sharing her experience, how she um, deal, how she dealt with a challenge, 
And yeah. I guess it's something that is instructive. Don't sweep it under the carpet. But I would always put this caveat, know who you are dealing with. Uh -huh. It's not everyone that is just able to take a matter, you know, the way she has taken, you know, the way that she's described her husband as uh -huh. someone who can handle it. Okay, this was what you were doing before we got married. You're not doing it anymore. It's not everyone that can handle it that way. But thank God she has that kind of person who is able to say, oh, is this what you want? Let's work at it. Mm. But communication is always the bloodline of any relationship. You must always try to keep in communicate your expectation. I think these five points, for me, these five points, when, when should I pray for my union? I think they're so instructive. If everybody can take a hold of these five things, they are so, for me, I like a gospel I can relate with. These uh -huh. are relatable, relatable thing. When you're running low on trust, when you're depleting in intimacy, when you start having a sense of being used, and when it's more argumentative than a conversation that is cordial, and when you begin to feel a sense of depression or you feel isolated, fantastic. I think everybody should be able to relate with this and know when to pray. What I put on my Instagram this evening, I said you are at risk. You are actually at risk if you are not praying now. For me, prayer is not quantity, it's quality. If you do 10, 15 minutes prayer that you touch the heaven, it's better than being in an hour of prayer and your mind is on Russia and Ukraine, your mind comes back to Nigeria where our Nepal light grid has died. You're not praying. But 15 minutes of tabling and Bible thing is Jeremiah say you pour your heart out like what it's effective. People should not run away from prayer because um, our graces differ. Know how you pray, but whatever you do, make sure you're praying. So kudos to my sister B to I'm glad. She knows what works and she's working. All right. Uh, before we draw the curtains today, I want to ask those in the Bahamas. Uh, Betty Ann, do you have anything to add to this? Betty Ann? Where is she? Do you have anything to add? Or I'm anything here. To raise uh, from today's uh, session? No, I, I found it very um, helpful okay. um, in terms of a single person. You know, some people are willing to listen. Okay. You know, if you, you share with your perspective or your the person that you're um, dating or whatever, how you feel, you know, some people might receive it well. Some other people might think, say, for example, some other man might think that you are being pushy you're being obnoxious. How dare you say what you want and what you don't want? If you are saying this now, it means that once we come into this relationship, I am in for trouble with this girl. You know, and some people might see it like that. Oh. I don't know if you understand what I mean. Yeah. You know, because as you, you shared before, oh. you need to know that you have an understanding with the person and you're free to talk. Oh. You know, both partners should be able to talk and say what you like, what you don't like, because a relationship would not grow unless you know what are the things that the person likes and what they do not like. Okay, and in that, some relationships... Just a little one, if you don't mind. Uh, what mm -hmm. would you like uh, a perspective, one critical thing a perspective should know about you, which will enable them to love you satisfactorily? Um, I'm somebody who likes to talk. I love to communicate. You know, I don't like to, I don't see things and leave it alone. If I see something that I, I like, I would talk about it. If I see something that I, I don't like, or I think it, it, it's not helpful for us, I would say. So um, I think I enjoy talking because I, I, I like to read people and I like to surprise people. So if I know that, I notice certain things that you like or what you talk about that you like to engage in a conversation about sports or whatever, I would try to participate. And I would like someone to be interested 
or show interest in the things that I am interested in as well. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll draw the curtains here today. And um, remember, if you have questions, if you have need for counseling, you can always call myself or my wife to schedule uh, private times of counseling. And then the meetings will continue again next week, Monday, uh, the same time, 6 p.m. in Nigeria. We have just reset our time in the springs here. So we are now five hours behind you, no longer six hours. You know, so please invite your friends and prayerfully, you know, uh, share some of the things that you have learned from here, even with them. And uh, let God use you to help their own situation in Jesus' name. Uh, on behalf of my wife and all the great, great supporters, you know, of this ministry, I want to wish you a wonderful week ahead and uh, let it be a week of pleasantness, a week of supernatural interventions, a week of reconciliations and recoveries, restorations, even in those areas where you had lost some ground in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Have a great week, people. God amen. bless. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Amen. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.